हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू अनुज क्लास रूम सो आई होप आर यूनिट वन लेसन वीडियो वॉज बेनिफिशियल फॉर यू गाइज टू गेट एन ओवर व्यू अबाउट वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन यूनिट वन सिमिलरली वी विल टेक अप यूनिट टू इन दिस वीडियो सो सिंस द टॉपिक्स दैट आर कवर्ड इन यूनिट टू डील्स विद मेनली डील्स विद द मैक्रो एकनॉमिक कॉन्सेप्ट विच इज वॉट वी हैड एंडेड अवर यूनिट वन विथ since it is a little bit uh, vast uh, new kind of areas like economic models and uh, you know we are talking about inflation and things like that uh, if you are from a economics background commerce background then definitely this will be a piece of cake for you but for those who don't have such a background maybe you guys are coming from a science background or even arts background or uh, maybe you have lost touch on uh, the commerce uh, economics aspects of it then uh it will be a little bit uh, what you can say difficult to grasp everything so that's why in order to cover all the uh, all the topics in a decent manner i thought uh, we will split this unit into two parts so this is the part 1 i will soon be uploading the part 2 as well so with part 1 and part 2 you will have a complete picture of your unit 2 also so this unit is titled economic growth and development so we all want to be a financially successful people correct um not just us but also people around us also is there anybody whom we have met who doesn't want to be financially successful maybe if, even if you are ultra rich then definitely yes the point is we want to grow our economic or financial uh, portfolio right that is everybody's dream these days so when you project it towards the whole nation what we are talking about is as a nation the goal is to achieve economic development economic growth we need that financial stability why the reason being it is with economic growth that we can have a much better lifestyle much better facilities infrastructure and everything why are young people migrating a lot these days to us or canada uh, european nations or even australia the reason being the standard of living in those countries are much better the facilities are much better the roads are cleaner mm, everything is much better compared to india correct so what we are hoping over there is when we are living in an economically developed nation we will have those many uh, benefits as a whole as a community we don't have to spend a fortune in uh, you know getting good food or uh, things like that or having uh, uh, to walk in a clean area things like that we don't have to spend extra money on it it is already part of the infrastructure so that is what every nation is aiming to achieve even us india as a whole we are also aiming to achieve economic growth and prosperity so higher achieving a higher rate of economic growth is the objective of every nation around the world and with economic growth production and employment income savings investment everything in the country will increase the standard of living will improve and country will prosper people will prosper with it so the the question here is how do we achieve such an economic growth what factors could be contributing towards it why are some nations underdeveloped how can we overcome property uh, poverty these are the questions which come up when we think about economic growth so throughout the world's history many people have already tried to find explanations for questions like these and in this unit we will also try to understand a few concepts related to economic growth and development why because economic growth uh, when we set up business in any nation its economic growth will Uh, play a very big part in how our investments come in how we can source our resources the uh, the domestic market uh, how easily can we trade internationally all these things come into picture so with this video in this particular part let us try to understand two main things that is the basic concept of economic growth economic development and a few indicators of economic development along with we will talk about the major theories of economic growth we will talk about harrod dormer model solo model endogenous growth theory and major theories also of underdevelopment so you might have noticed that some countries of the world like say usa germany etc are termed as developed countries whereas some countries like our country india or our neighbor china and such countries are classified as developing and then there are still more countries in the world which are called underdeveloped like cambodia bhutan nepal even many of our neighbors uh, themselves right are classified as underdeveloped so how does this classification happen anu you don't know we already know it we have already studied it in school you might be thinking <laughs> okay so in that case well and good 
but in case you guys missed it and you are still wondering well this classification is done by different world organizations like our united nations world bank and all from time to time this criteria changes also and uh, they uh, basically take up the economic indicators of the nation the macroeconomic indicators like maybe gdp and uh, gdi that is gross domestic index things like that they will take up and they will uh, analyze and they will set thresholds and uh, they will say that okay if the country is uh, crossing this particular threshold then we will tell as de they are developing and if they cross a certain other threshold then they are already developed and anywhere below uh, the very first threshold we will talk call them as underdeveloped so that is how this indication this bifurcation happens so this economic growth indicates an increase in the national income as well as the total output of the country and only with economic growth can we promise that standard of living of the people of that particular country will improve uh, so let us go ahead and discuss in short some of the major theories of economic growth as well as that of underdevelopment now okay the main one of the important models that we will be talking about in this model is called as the Harrow Dahmer model of economic growth so this model was given by two economists namely Roy Harrod and FSA Dahmer I hope I am pronouncing the names properly and this theory was put forth in the early 1950s so it is quite old okay um, almost going to hit 75 years now and it highlights the role of savings and investment in economic growth so according to this model the growth rate in an economy is dependent upon two factors one is the savings to income rate okay how much we save to versus what is our income so what portion of income are we able to save that is the first part and the second part is the capital to output ratio that is how much capital is we are having to invest in order to produce a certain level of output like for example over here in india generally if you think about it the production cost of things are comparatively higher than that of china right so with the same amount of capital you can produce more things if you are investing it in china than in india that is how the trend is going right now that is why uh, there are many things that are made in china not much in uh, much that is made in japan or made in india and all right so that is another indicator so there are two one is the saving income rate and the other is the capital output ratio so this model is based on uh, many assumptions as well like there will not be any government interference in how the market works that is nothing but the last is fair then there is full employment in the economy this economy is a closed economy we have a law of constant returns to scale that is if we are uh, increasing the capital by 10 percent then our uh, what you can say output will also in increase by 10 percent or if we are increasing the income by 10 percent then naturally people will also increase their savings by 10 percent so that is the law of constant returns to scale also there is no technical progress while we are talking okay there is neutral technical progress things like that so based on all these assumptions only this harrow dormer growth model of economic growth is being proposed so in this model uh, three growth rates have been explained okay one is the actual growth then we have the warranted growth and the natural growth rate the actual growth rate is what is actually happening okay as the name suggests the actual rate of savings and investment that is the actual growth rate so if actually savings is increasing and the investment is increasing then yes the actual growth rate is positive then if the economy is making optimum use of its all resources and is working at full capacity okay they are utilizing all their resources to the maximum then that is the warranted growth rate okay it is also known as the full capacity growth rate or potential growth rate and natural growth rate that is the third okay that is like the maximum growth that economy can achieve with the natural resources that they have okay it is the natural growth rate it is the maximum no matter how hard you try assuming laissez fair assuming full employment assuming everything that this model assumes you cannot go beyond the natural growth rate if you want to go beyond then this assumption has to break one or more assumption has to break only then you can achieve okay so that is the three rates of growth that uh, this model is trying to uh, what you can say help us understand or is trying uh, uh, give, asking us to measure now Harrod Dormer model it highlights that investment in a, in such an economy has two roles okay it is a dual role what are these two roles is one is with investment your income will increase through a multiplier process okay why 
you are investing that investment becomes capital more capital means more production more production means more people get employment if the company is doing well naturally if, if there is full employment there is no uh, loan resource waiting to be hired then whoever is being employed will definitely get higher salary correct so that is increasing income due to increasing investment the second thing is it enhances the productive capacity obviously as there is more investment then we can uh, with that investment we can purchase more and more raw materials we can gather more and more resources and therefore our capacity will again increase so this is the dual role of investment according to the Harad Dormer model so accordingly a lack of savings and a deficiency of investment will become a major bottleneck in the path of economic growth of a country that means if people are not investing if people are not saving enough from their income it is going to hamper the economic growth of the nation so uh, accordingly the government of whoever is in charge of that economy has to take measures in order to mobilize all the domestic savings and create an investment mindset and achieve higher economic growth so currently in india also if you can see um, right now the in uh, what you can say uh, the interest rates and all are slowly increasing but a few uh, like a few years back government did not want any of us to put money in the banks and keep it right the interest rates were very low they were trying to push money into the market and uh, people had to find other ways of investments they were trying to invest in the stock markets and or maybe even start their own businesses rather than piling up money in banks government is pushing us to take up new ventures invest and produce more so that is how it is there right now i think there is a little bit too much money in the market so they are trying to pull it back that is why we can see slowly interest rates are being uh, increased by banks so all these things are affecting right so think about it if your ft is only going to give you 4% will you put ft or will you go for some other investment methods right you will be investing in some uh, in in some uh, what you can say business which will give you more returns correct so what is happening your savings is getting converted into investment that is what is happening there okay so that is the harald dormer model of economic growth the other model that we will be talking about in this video is the solo model okay this solo model is also known as the neoclassical growth theory and was set or propounded by robert solo in the year 1956 not long uh, uh, what you can say not long after the harold dormer model was given just six years gap and we have a new model known as the neoclassical growth theory or solo model so this model says that the changes in the population growth rate rate of the technological progress and savings rate will bring about changes in the level of output and thereby economic growth so there are three basic propositions of this neoclassical theory the first is that the growth of output in the long run steady state is determined by the rate of growth of labor force and the rate of growth of labor productivity that is in the long run if output has to improve or increase then the labor force has to grow and the labor productivity also has to grow only if these two factors are met can you uh, make or bring about a growth in output in the long run second is the level of per capita income depends upon the rate of savings and investment to the gdp gross domestic product third is that there will be a convergence in the income levels of different countries with certain uh, assumptions related to labor force growth savings depreciation and productivity growth and all even this model has a lot of assumptions coming to uh, with it that is the labor force will grow at a constant rate all savings will be converted into investment constant returns to scale is also a factor here output is a function of capital and labor both factors are subjected to diminishing pro productivity all these things okay so that is nothing but that output requires in order to improve output capital and labor has to both increase otherwise it will lead to lesser uh, productivity is what is assumed okay so those are again the assumptions so that is the halo model and the solo model sorry harold dormer model and the solo model the third one is the endogenous growth theory or the new growth theory okay so it is a concept that economic growth is due to factors that are internal to the economy and not because of external ones so that means if india has to grow according to this endogenous growth theory or the new growth theory then the growth should come due to internal factors how our internal uh, labor forces utilized how our internal resources are utilized how in you know, technology is available internally 
things like that how good is our internal infrastructure and not due to external factors so this theory is built on the idea that improvements in the innovation knowledge human capital and all will lead to increased productivity and will positively affect our economic outlook so it suggests that government or the public policy okay in charge should work in the direction of expanding the budget and expenditures on creating this human capital this technological advancements and everything promote create a conductive environment that will attract foreign private investment in the fields like software development information technology telecommunications and all only then if internally we can bring about more capital we can bring about uh, what you can say um advancements um utilize our young talent only then we can improve our economic growth that is on the lines of which i can say for example make in india is being promoted we are trying to utilize everything internally so as you can see right now by now you might have understood uh, a nation doesn't uh, work on just one theory okay of economic growth multiple theories are uh, being worked upon on various aspects of the economy in order to bring forth that economic development and push us into the developed category from the developing category okay the next important aspect in this particular section as we are discussing is the major theories of under development so as we understood many countries of the world are labeled as under developed so why is the reason why they are remaining as under developed does it mean that they are not at all developing is it that they are going backwards maybe some countries are but mostly from time to time this uh, you know this criteria gets revised the threshold definitely gets revised and um, and these countries are not able to catch up with uh, how the rest of the world is performing that is one of the main reasons so why are they not able to catch up we have many theories regarding this under development uh, but we won't definitely we will not be uh, explaining all those theories from our course perspective we have mainly five theories that we need to know the vicious circle of poverty low level equilibrium trap critical minimum effort uh, theory of big push and stages of economic growth rosto stages of economic growth so these are the five major theories of under development that we are expected to know from ignos side so let us look at those things one by one okay so first and foremost the vicious circle of poverty if i have to uh, summarize this theory in just a one phrase it talks about how poverty breeds poverty okay so according to this vicious circle of poverty theory poverty is deemed as the main cause of poverty okay and in the words of professor nox who is the propounder of this theory it is the circular constellation of forces that tend to act and react in such a way as to keep a country in the state of poverty this circle works from both the supply side and demand side how from the supply side from the supply side low income okay that is poverty translates to low savings low savings means low investment low investment means there is a low rate of capital formation okay low per capita uh, low per capita capital so it leads to low productivity low productivity means low employment and low production so definitely low income again so that is how from the supply side we can look at it from the demand side again if we don't have much income okay what will happen we will cut short on our consumption we will only buy the most necessary things right so low consumption low consumption means low demand for goods and services that means less in intense incentive for investment as well as production we don't have anything so we are not buying anything because nobody is buying people are not willing to start it as a business and produce why why should i produce something which nobody is willing to buy why should i put my money i i myself don't have money right so that is the problem poverty breeding poverty so under developed countries we'll have to break this circle of poverty okay with the help of entrepreneurship and labor force only then they will be able to come out of this shackle and uh, you know rise above that poverty that is what the vicious circle of poverty theory is saying the next one is the low level of equilibrium trap model again if we are to summarize it in just one phrase we can say that according to this theory it is that people are too poor to save and without savings no investment no production right so this is a concept a concept again which is developed by richard r nelson in which at low levels of per capita income uh, people are too poor to save and therefore invest much and this low level of investment will result in 
low rate of growth in national income. So accordingly what we require as a society is that there we need a quantum leap above this minimum per capita income. People should be able to raise the level of savings beyond this level so that we can raise the national income and bring about economic growth. Okay. So the next is critical minimum effort theory. So according to Professor Harvey Libenstein, the overpopulated and underdeveloped countries are characterized by this vicious circle of poverty. Correct. They have low per capita income. So in his theory of this critical minimum effort, uh, he is trying to provide a solution to this economic problem of poverty circle. According to him, he says that a critical minimum effort is necessary to achieve a steady economic growth rising per capita income. So the main idea of this theory is that economic growth in an underdeveloped and overpopulated country will not be possible unless we can bring about a certain minimum level of investment. Okay, if we are not able to gather it from inside, then maybe from outside, we will have to inject it into the system as a consolidated dose, which pulls the system out of this uh, circle. And this minimum level of investment is what is called as the critical minimum effort. So from all these uh, theories that we have developed uh, or seen so far, we are seeing that we need a critical, what you can say, we need a considerable amount of uh, investment push coming from outside and outside external force is required to push uh, the countries from that uh, trapped state and project them outside, right? So that is uh, summarized as the theory of big push, you can say. That is, bit by bit is not going to work. We need a big push, just like an airplane, okay? If it has to go up from the ground, it has to rise up, means it needs a considerable amount of thrust, right? It has to have that big push. Then only it will be airborne and once it is airborne, it will go. So, Professor Paul N. Ronstein Rodden gave this theory of big push in 1943 actually. And according to this theory of big push, this bit by bit investment program will not yield the desired result in underdeveloped countries. Okay, they need huge and comprehensive investment package. That is a big push to move them from the stage of underdevelopment towards development. According to Ronstein Rodden, marginal increments in investment in unrelated individual spots of economy would be just like sprinkling water in a desert. If you are just going to spray some water in a desert, what will happen? Will you see something? No, nothing. Not even a grain of, grain of sand is going to become wet, right? It's all going to evaporate. Similarly, he is saying a sizable lump of investment has to be injected all at once in all sectors together at a time to make a difference. Only then you will be able to see some difference in the economy. Okay, so he, uh, Professor Rodan distinguishes three kinds of indivisibilities and externalities with a view to specify those areas where this big push has to be applied. Okay, so first he is saying, so these three areas he is saying we have to push together. First is the production fu function. Okay. Next is the demand. Okay. And third is savings. So production, demand, savings, all these three have to be pushed at the same time considerably in order to sh break that shackle and come out of it. That is the theory of big push. Now, the last theory that we will be talking about in this uh, video is of the five stages of economic growth propounded by Rostow. I know this video is getting quite lengthy, right? That is why I thought we will split this video into two, in this unit into two. I hope you guys are not getting bored. I promise this is going to be over soon. Okay, so Rosto, in his book, in uh, which is published in 1960, the book is called The Stages of Economic Growth, a Non-Communist Manifesto. Okay, so it is kind of like a novel you can think of. He, Rosto, elaborated a linear stages of growth model, which came to define development as a sequence of stages through which all societies must pass okay and this is what came to be known as the five stages of economic growth and it became the basic blueprint for modernization theory okay so it is this rusto's five stages of economic growth that we are actually thinking about whenever we talk about economic growth knowingly or unknowingly you guys must have talked about it when you so i'll tell you the five stages okay the first stage is the traditional society hmm? so in that when you think about our uh, ancestors what comes into your mind? Primitive people, just agriculture, don't know any technology, not at all sophisticated, having a lot of superstitions, like that we think, right? So, and then later on, it uh, progressed. Now, 
came our uh, maybe our grandfathers or grandmothers our parents who are much more advanced correct and then again now we are here very smart people knows how to do use the latest technology and everything right and then we think about our future they are going to be much better than us and then india is going to be wow earlier it was dumb now it is wow right we all think like that correct so this is something that happened uh, because of this five stages of economic growth model now actually when you come to think about it our ancestors weren't that stupid when you think about that era in this valley civilization the indian civilizations was at its peak then but still we feel that our ancestors were primitive okay that is okay it came from outside that theory sorry that thought okay so coming to our discussion the traditional society that is the first stage according to roster stages of economic growth the thing is that even before the britishers arrived we were already in the maturity stage we were already there we had already bypassed our traditional society but still we think that that age was traditional what to do many of us right even i, I would say even myself uh, until a few years till until a few years back when i actually started thinking and dissecting how i got these feelings and all and now i recognize that it is a dumb thought there okay so the traditional society is very primitive according to in those two stages of economic growth and that is true also this stage just that uh, our timelines got a bit messed up right anyways definitely even in india in this valley there might have been one point where there was a very primitive society with limited technology reliance on subsistence farming with absolutely no form of advanced banking right it would definitely would have been there primitive people now from that society what happens is that people start seeing possibilities for improvement skill specialization grows there becomes there will come a considerable investment on infrastructure this stage is what we call as precondition for take off and after that soon enough actual take off will happen economic growth will become self sustaining huge technological advancements will happen domestic manufacturing sector will develop and all these will lead to a rapid increase of regional cities and service industries so that is the take off and once we take off post take off we can observe that there will be a drive of maturity where domestic boundaries will again widen and imports will get substituted with the domestic production and investments also will diversify okay and the last stage is the fifth stage is called the age of mass consumption and it is characterized by an economy which becomes heavily geared towards service provision due to exploiting the comparative advantage in trade and commerce okay and also this is the stage where there is a very high quality world class infrastructure coming into existence and society is in the developed category right now okay so those were the five stages of economic Uh, sorry those were the major theories of under development and i hope you guys have an idea about the whole concept of economic growth the various theories and all if a question comes asking you about harrow domer model or solo model or the indigenous growth theory or rostos five stages of economic growth and all i hope now you are in a better position to answer such questions this unit is far from over we'll have uh, i hope one more part Uh, if required maybe i'll split it into one more and make it three perhaps but i hope that uh, with one more video one more session we will be able to wind up our unit two and uh, move ahead with other units i hope these classes you are finding them useful all the very best for your term and examinations until i see you in the next session thank you so much bye bye